a quick sound check. Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Yeah, Elliot, Matt, thank you. Uh, thank you both, Elliot, for the, the multiple introductions there. Uh, as uh, Super excited to be here, and it's a real privilege, uh, so I appreciate everyone's time. Um, as Elliot said, my name is Kyle Heldman, and I'm here with my fellow product manager, Rob Everett, and we are on the product development team for Marketing Cloud. And on the agenda, as Matt was kind of diving into, is uh, we want to take a look at this marketing the marketing cloud summer release here, uh, taking a look at some of our newest developer capabilities. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, make sure everyone can see that. All right, I think we're good. So first. Uh, in true Salesforce fashion, we have our Salesforce safe harbor statement. Uh, today, I will be, uh, Rob and I will be diving into mostly things that exist, but some current uh, roadmap items. So please do keep that in mind. Um, so first, let's, uh, let's get into the good stuff here. In the summer release, uh, from kind of taking a look at uh, the developer capabilities, a few highlights uh, for everyone to just call out, check out uh, some new journey builder capabilities. We launched uh, we now support mobile app event entry and exit sources so take a look at that uh, and also the transactional apis for mobile push so similar to email and sms and then in our if you're familiar with uh, using the ens or the event notification service for you know email events uh, we now will authorize into you know external systems so we'll, we'll use the oauth2 framework uh, and use the password and client credential grant type so those are um, some some unique uh, developer centric uh, features there, and then to get into the meat of today's conversation, I am digging into Automation Studio, uh, where I want to talk about uh, some of the new import and export capabilities with S3 and Azure, as well as Automation Studio and a new start source that we have launching, and then following that, Rob will be digging into Package Manager, diving deep on solution packages version control and some other tips and tricks. So let's go ahead and get going. Okay, so Automation Studio. So importing and exporting files with AWS and Azure, as well as that new trigger start source. As many of you may already be aware of in this past winter release, uh, Marketing Cloud, uh, made available an, an integration with AWS S3. So you could import and export your marketing files directly into Marketing Cloud data extension. So we're doing that uh, using AWS authorization mechanisms such as the asset access key or IAM role authorization. And then what I'm super excited to announce is in this most recent summer release, we launched an Azure Blob uh, connection where now you can import and export files with Azure Blob uh, using Active Directory or their shared access signature authorization. And then uh, here coming soon, and it's in the works, is the ability to connect to Google Cloud Storage or your GCP uh, integration. So stay tuned for that one. Along with that, kind of it's still in that file uh, import and export space. Uh, inside of Automation Studio, for, for those of you that are familiar with you know, your, your schedule and your uh, file drop start sources, we now will have a third start source, uh, Trigger, which is similar to file drop. Uh, and, and now you can use the trigger, a file trigger API, kind of connecting to those public cloud sources. So we'll be listening to uh, kind of your extor external data sources uh, in an API call that will start an automation. So. Uh, you, you upload a file, you send us that file name, and Automation Studio will listen and evaluate the criteria in that file uh, or in, in that file name uh, to start the associated automation. So what, what, what does that mean? So as we kind of take a step back and look at you know, those capabilities at a whole, when I talk to lots of customers there, you know, data pipeline or, you know, file workflow into Marketing Cloud Data Extensions looks, you know, quite complicated usually, but something along the lines of a marketing team or automated system is uploading a file to a data store. Uh, usually there's an FTP server sitting on top of that uh, or an alternate uh, location altogether, some data manipulation occurring. And then they're pushing that file to the Marketing Cloud Enhanced FTP location. 
at which point it finally gets imported into a marking cloud data extension. So on the marking cloud side, we have you know taken a look at this process and, and worked very hard to improve and, and streamline uh, that process. And so now with you know some of the features that we just uh, have released, you know I think the pipeline starts to look more like this. So that marketing team or the automated system is uploading that file to um, to a S3 bucket or an Azure Blob container, Zoom GCP. You know those those platforms have the capability, typically in, in one way or the other, uh, to make an API call. So so an API call is triggered into the marketing cloud system where Automation Studio evaluates the information in that API call and will start the associated automation. And then as part of that automation, you can go and you know, import that specific file. So we will more or less reach into those particular locations and download that uh, file from those over HTTPS as opposed to FTP today. I like to, to think about this you know, solution as opposed to the previous one is kind of like a 10x better uh, pipeline. And, and the reason for, there's many reasons for that. And a few here highlighted, you know, one, we're using those cloud supported authorization mechanisms on, on AWS and Azure. Uh, so it's, it's very secure. It also allows you to use the folder management capabilities that those uh, public clouds enable. For those customers that have uh, security requirements of encrypting files, uh, client side, we still support that as well. Um, although we see many customers will now just allow list those those download AP, uh, IP addresses, and they can kind of get rid of that uh, the overhead or or uh, the latency that file encryption and decryption add. So, uh, kind of a security benefit there. And then downloading and, and uploading to and from public cloud directly, as opposed to going through FTP, uh, we're seeing a significant increase in that file transfer speed. So. Today on FTP, we might be seeing you know, one meg per second uh, type of speed, whereas on public cloud, we're seeing anywhere from 50 to 100, depending on uh, you know, different client-side implementation uh, and, and toggles. Just to peel back that file trigger API, so this is the API that uh, is being uh, triggered from those you know, public cloud or application platforms from, you, from the customer side. You can kind of see it's a it's a limited payload here where it's primarily just that file name uh, and the file location customer key, which is more or less a, a pointer to the credentials that you've uploaded to Marketing Cloud to be able to access that file. And so Automation Studio is listening to all of these trigger APIs and then evaluating and finding uh, which automation it needs to start so it can begin that and, and get going right away. There's also this deduplicate key where you know passing that. Uh, will ensure that that file only gets processed the one time. So to kind of take a quick step back, uh, just to uh, enable everyone here, you know, two, two scenarios here. How do I connect to a file location for file import and export? Uh, as I mentioned, the S3 bucket capability was released this past winter. Uh, so there's lots of documentation around that. Check out Marketing Cloud File Locations. For the most recent Azure Blob storage container, there's a beta around that that you can sign up for, and we'll start to enable accounts here starting in July. Uh, so check out that link, and, and then there's also some documentation on that. Uh, Google Cloud Storage, that's that's coming, so stay tuned. Uh, as well as if you still have uh, you know an SFTP server sitting in front of you know your data store, we can reach out to that as well in that trigger um, scenario. So check out how to do that. And then uh, again on the on the trigger uh, beta as well. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, check out that link. There's a lot of documentation around that API, and well as just how to set up uh, the you know the marketing cloud automation. So with that, I will now hand it over to Rob to dive into Package Manager. Rob, take it away. Yeah, I hope you're on mute. Unmute is on the bottom of the page. So if you go directly down and to the left, uh, it's next to the Salesforce Trailblazer Community button um, logo. 
and there's just a button there which will say unmute. You see that, Rob? Yeah, it was. Uh, there was a microphone uh, selection that was choosing a different microphone than my headphones. I apologize for that. I was unmuted, but it was selected the right thing. All right. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Rob Everett's product manager for uh, MC Package Manager. So excited to be here and talk through um, a little bit what we've achieved here in 2022, uh, what's coming up next, and also dive into some tips and tricks because I know that um, a lot of what we hear is, you know, how are how are others using it and um, what consideration should I have uh, when I am using it. So go to the next slide, please. So 2022, um, we have covered covered these three main uh, three main topics. One is package version control. So you notice we rolled out uh, kind of over a few releases the capability to um, to create different actions for the items that you're that you're deploying, right? So we started off with just the ability to create new items when we went GA last year. Uh, we we knew we always had version control in our roadmap. We knew that we would be at some point kind of updating that. Uh, we took a lot of customer feedback and and uh, shaped exactly how we ended up implementing that. But we've got sort of paired actions. And I'll dive into that a little bit in, in a minute, but the paired actions of create versus skip for a new item or reuse versus update for uh, existing items. So that kind of gives you the, the more granular control over what you can and can't do, what you uh, can deploy versus not deploy, uh, especially with all of your dependencies. And I'll talk a little bit about how we, we manage those dependencies with those actions as well. Um, the second main item that we released actually in between uh, the first two releases of the year was deploying via installed packages. So you'll notice that you can now save your, your package file not only as a zip, but also as JSON. And at this point, you can now uh, put that JSON in a location where that's accessible via a URL that you can then create uh, a, a solution package component and put that in an installed package, which gives you quite a bit more control over how you deploy changes across environments, for example, so you're not just emailing zip files back and forth. Uh, there's a lot, lot better uh, control over that and kind of a stepping stone towards an eventual, um, and I'll talk about this when I talk about roadmap, an eventual integration into App Exchange. And then rounding out support for existing objects. So you'll notice that we uh, continue to try to, to round out uh, uh, support for everything that's in Journey Builder as much as we uh, can get out there. But you know this, the wait until activities and all that, we've added support uh, in the latest uh, release. So next slide. So let me dive a little bit more into this version control and the granularity there. So in the screenshot, you see the action column. The action column is what we added when we added all the, the, the version control capabilities. But what we do is we match based on name. If we find the name exists, then we will default to the action of use current installed item. But we can also update an item. So for example, you find an existing journey, you can leave that existing journey alone, or let's say you've created a new draft version and you want to update that draft version into your destination environment. So then you can just click the update action and it'll, it'll, update, uh, it'll update that, or an automation, for example. And what it does is it actually, with a journey, it looks to see if you have an existing uh, version, uh, draft version rather, if you do have an existing draft version, it will overwrite that draft version. If you don't have a draft version, let's say uh, the latest version in your destination environment is running, it'll create a new draft out of that version that was in the package. So um, it kind of looks for, for that kind of control. And, and with automations, uh, you can't update until you actually pause that automation. So we, we don't allow you to make updates to a running automation so that we don't uh, collide and, and make any unwanted changes there. So um, a lot of those are just sort of, you know, guardrails that we put in place. Um, and you'll notice sort of updated actions. And I'll talk a little bit about those updated actions and warnings and, and errors uh, a little bit later. But um, this is sort of what we what we came up with version control. And, and before I move on, I want you to notice like the third row down there, there is uh, I'm editing the name of that item. That controls, again, we, we match on name, right? We can control the actions based on whether that is a name match. Uh, we found that a lot of customers were, you know, had different naming conventions. Uh, for example, if they're using a dev test prod, like separate BUs, and they have the same stuff set up, but they've got underscore test or underscore prod in their names. And as we're deploying, it'll say, oh, I can't find uh, a name match for that. Well, you actually can do that by just changing that name right here. You can get rid of the underscore test, put in underscore prod, refresh your validation, and it'll actually find that and allow you to update. So I uh, just want to point that out. I'm going to uh, dive into that in a, in a little bit more detail later too. Uh, next slide, please. Installed packages. 
So as I mentioned before, one of the things that we introduced, it was actually back in March, um, was the ability to create a component called a solution package component and put that within an installed package. It, it can actually be bundled up with a bunch of different solution packages. So um, you may be aware that we have like a 50 megabyte file limit, which is sort of a soft limit, but we have that, that file size limit. But if you want to uh, roll out a lot of different changes, a lot of different solutions across either multiple organizations, your consultant, you're trying to update uh, customers with, with multiple different solutions, or you are trying to do this kind of migration strategy uh, across different BUs, you can bundle up several different solutions into one installed package. And you can put anything else that you would normally put in an installed package in the same package itself. So let's say you want to roll out uh, solution packages uh, that include some custom content blocks, custom journey builder activities, bundle all that up in one installed package and you can roll that out. The way that that works for solution packages, again, as I mentioned, you save your JSON file to a, a location that can be accessed via URL. You post that, you paste that URL into your solution package component, save it, publish your installed package, and then let's say you want to do updates. All you have to do is update that JSON file in the location where it is. You don't change the URL. You don't have to republish anything with the install package. You just update that JSON file. And then you can then redeploy. So what I don't show here is in the deployment flow, you can select between uploading a zip file or select from previously installed solutions via the installed package. So if I need to deploy that solution, I update my file, and then I tell the person in that business unit who's going to deploy that, hey, go deploy that solution again. Uh, I've made some updates. And so you select that, you can select the, the package that you're referring to, and you can make those updates all without like emailing these files back and forth and uh, trying to re-upload or republish anything. So try to streamline that process a little bit and, and give better uh, controls over that. All right, next slide, please. So customer success. So again, I think we, we often hear, you know, how are people benefiting from, from package manager and and I think the, the primary takeaway is uh, that, that you are able, your marketing organization, whether you're a consultant or your customer, you're able to focus more on your value added strategic activities. You're reducing your time for migrations, for implementations by 50% by not having all of these manual, previously uh, very error prone uh, activities of copying and pasting. Some consultants actually developed a lot of their own tools that kind of skirted around a lot of the, the shortcomings of our APIs. Package Manager took all of that and kind of tried to, to build upon all of that and make that streamline, right? We have found that customers, even if it doesn't solve every issue for a migration, for example, doesn't cover BU metadata, but we still can take a huge amount of that lift of, of that rote task that people were, were spending a lot of money doing in the past and spending a lot of time doing uh, and take that away and, and, and be able to focus in on what is my, my marketing strategy? What should I be focusing on? Let me let me work on that cross-channel strategy, et cetera. So it, it really kind of, it, it improves and elevates customers' ability to take themselves to the ne that next level. So let's talk a little bit about tips and tricks on the next slide. Um, these are things to consider when using Package Manager. So um, when you're when you're bundling things up, what we uh, hear a lot is, "Hey, I've bundled all these things up, but I've I've got some shared data extensions across my packages." Well, that's one thing you should probably consider doing. If you know that there's a certain set of journeys, you're welcome to new or lapsed journeys that might all use or reference the same DEs, the same data structures and attribute groups, same automations, etc. Bundle those together if you can, uh, because that just reduces your your work. Now, with version control and the ability to kind of reuse existing items. Um, it's not going to create all that new stuff that it used to, right? Like that was the, the main complaint we got when we first rolled out is, great, I'm deploying multiple packages that are referencing the same DE, but I'm recreating that same DE duplicated over and over. Well, you don't do that anymore with version control, but you could kind of do that one reference to that same DE if you package those journeys together and just kind of roll all that out at once because we only create it once when we find that same reference. Um, and again, keep in mind the package size should be less than 50 megabytes. It's less of a strict rule than it used to be. Uh, that was when we first released, we were a Heroku app. Um, we actually became part of the, the main marketing cloud code base. It's less restrictive, but if you consider trying to get too big, you have too many journeys, you have too many things, that's gonna, again, we can nest a lot of different dependency management in there. That can get pretty complicated, the bigger that file can get and, and the more uh, errors you could potentially open up. Uh, marketing Cloud Connect, if you are multi-org, uh, it's really best to consider using local DEs as an alternative option uh, than your sync DEs only because a lot of the, the, the uh, references to those multi-org uh, things in Connect can get pretty, pretty hairy. 
Um, it allows you to kind of process things in your standard DE schema if you use an automation to transfer the, the sync DEs into standard, standard DEs. But consider that if you are going to use that strategy that you want to be able to have a reference where those sync DEs are not referenced. So for example, if you use an automation to uh, whittle down your audience for a journey builder entry source, for example, use an automation that only puts some filter criteria on the DE that you want to use rather than the automation that actually transforms the data from your sync DEs into your standard DE because we still find that reference in that automation to the sync DE and then we're going to try to bundle all that up again. It's, it's that dependency management is really strong, but it can also be a weakness when it gets super complex, right? So if you're going to use the strategy, just consider using automations that only reference those, those local DEs in your standard DE schema to, to simplify things. Um, and then package management and version control. Again, this is just a note to remember that you have to use some sort of third-party source control that has allows you to access that file that JSON file via a URL. All right, so then um, next slide is consideration. So these are things you should plan ahead when using Package Manager. In addition to what I mentioned with multi-org, just sync DEs in general, you're going to have to have your, your environments created exactly the same in your source environment and your destination environment. So again, all of those things that you configure with your objects, um, all of your attributes, those need to be mapped exactly or else you're gonna get a, an error when you go to deploy. Because if that, uh, you know, if that has been updated, if your object's been updated and has some additional fields uh, that weren't uh, mapped in your, your uh, source environment, you're gonna get an error. So just make sure that all of those things are well in sync before you actually go to package and deploy those items. Um, shared content and shared data extensions. Shared content is always going to be deployed as a local uh, uh, item when you go to deploy that in a target environment. We're never gonna recreate that as shared. It just doesn't make sense. Um, that's just kind of how the, the way that that's built. Shared DEs, on the other hand, are supported. So if we find that a shared DE doesn't exist in our target environment, we will go to the enterprise level account, create the shared DE and share that down to the child DE that you're deploying in. Um, so that, that's one thing just to note is that those are different between content and data extensions. Mobile Connect, and this sort of applies to, to email as well, right? Standalone Mobile Connect campaigns, just like standalone send definitions, are not supported. But the SMS and Journey Builder activity is fine if you have Mobile Connect configured. And of course, the, the email activities in Journey Builder uh, are also fully supported. Um, and with data extracts, we've heard this. Uh, we heard this especially early on, and we added support for data extracts. But we do only support the standard DE extract. Um, that covers 87% of all uh, data extract activities that we found when we did an analysis, but uh, so we don't support the tracking extracts, custom extracts, that gets because of our dependency management feature, uh, just gets really too, com too complex there. So just keep that in mind when, uh, when, when you're looking at including data extracts in your automations uh, when being packaged and deployed. All right, next slide, please. Now, what don't I know about? So we have found there are a couple of pretty powerful features that customers weren't using, weren't taking advantage of. And so I, I just wanna highlight them because I wanna highlight the power of, the, of these features, especially the hyper-personalization. So we know that, or I think a lot of people know that there's this personalization string built into Package Manager that allows you to select different things as you're packaging and then deploying these items, uh, string replacement. So for example, the, the thing that we always put out there is put your link to your logo file, put your company name, but it can be quite a bit more powerful than that. And I think that's why we, we haven't seen people use it as I don't think we've, we've really highlighted how powerful it can be. So we had a financial services customer that actually used this. They had uh, agents in regions and each of those regions, so let's say where I'm located in central Indiana, there were five agents in that region, but they all had the same service portal uh, link in, uh, in core. So they uh, each different region would have a different link to their service portal. That service portal link can then be inserted and they wanted that inserted into their email. So they use the replacement string for that service portal as they were rolling out these best practice journeys across each region. So they put in the region specific uh, URL for their support portal and the photos of each of their agents into that uh, email. So as they were deploying, they did that and then any reference to that within those emails was then updated. Uh, another customer is actually using it to um, replace hex codes for all their branding and their CSS style sheets. So like as you're uh, putting in, um, you know, if you're rolling this again across multiple customers, you want to update branding colors on deployment, you can actually do that and just have the have the user input the hex code. Uh, and you'll see actually in a minute, we're going to make that a lot easier in, in the coming release. But um, there are other ways, other creative ways that you can use that personalization feature to really 
control your branding beyond just the basic logo company name, et cetera. And then I mentioned this before, but we actually found that the customers just weren't aware of this editing items in line. So again, as I mentioned in the migration uh, example, you've got different naming conventions between environments. People thought, oh, well, I got to, now I have to create this new thing or I have to skip it and come back and recreate it and do it. You don't, you just have to update the name. So click on that pencil icon, you can update the name in line, refresh your validation, and then you can actually uh, update your actions uh, and update something that might not have had the same name between your environments, but we will then uh, match that name uh, because we're, we allow you to edit that. All right, next slide. So before I dive into what's next, I wanna talk about a little bit of why we have, uh, or how we have listened to customers and shifted our roadmap uh, since we went GA. So we knew that, that going, going out there, we needed to listen carefully to what uh, customers were saying. So we actually added these, these three things um, based on that customer feedback. One of the first things we did in the very first release after GA was transactional entry source support. So that transactional API entry source, uh, we hadn't had any plans for that, but but we were able to, to get that in with a little bit of work um, and, and introduce that version control, as I mentioned. We always had it on our roadmap, but the way that we implemented it changed over time. And that's why it took us a little bit longer to roll out because we were hearing from customers how they wanted it to work, how this migration strategy was working for them and how they wanted to be able to, to uh, use these action dependent actions and all that. Um, and even like with, with the, if you skip a high level item, for example, on deployment, it'll actually select your dependencies for you then. So if you skipped a journey, it'll skip or reuse any uh, uh, dependent act, uh, items that it finds in the package for you by default. And then in the most recent release that just went out a few weeks ago, enhanced tasks. So this is clearer messaging. I, I mean, if I could have you all raise your hands, I would. Who's encountered a lot of errors with package manager? I'm sure Elliot would raise your hand because I think that was one thing you told me about a while back uh, is that you know that was a blocker for a lot of customers. Hey, I'd love to be able to use this tool, but I'm getting errors. So we cleared out a, a huge majority of the errors that, that people were getting uh, when using the tool and turned those into warnings. And not only did we turn them into warnings, but where we could give you instruction on how to fix something. So for example, there's a missing item uh, in the configuration for one of your activities uh, in Journey Builder. There's a missing reference uh, in, in one of your assets. We'll actually tell you where to go find that thing and we'll give you a task as you deploy that you can then complete and say, okay, by the way, when you deploy this, you're not gonna be able to activate your journey because you need to fix this email activity. And we tell you what email activity, you need to update a missing reference or you need to update this, um, this email template that's referring to a data extension that we couldn't find. All those things now are, are not blockers anymore but we warn you that you're not gonna be able to activate that you may, you may have errors in your environment in that item once you deploy until you fix this thing. So we've kind of given you instructions on that and then rewritten a lot of our error messages to, to be a lot more friendly, tell you exactly what's going on, or again, remove the blocker error itself and just make an informational or warning text. So really quickly, roadmap, um, since we've implemented quite a few things, uh, in the recent past, our roadmap's a little bit light at the, at the moment, but as I mentioned, the color, uh, when I was mentioning the color uh, um, example, we're adding two new pickers in the next release, a color picker and an image picker. So we've introduced a little bit more syntax in that, um, in that personalization string. So after the MCPM colon, your input parameter that you would have had before, insert a pipe and then type colon color picker or image picker, you can actually even do text if that's what you're wanting to do too, although that's assumed by default. But then we'll actually allow you to pick a color from a, from a color wheel. We'll allow you to pick an image from your stored images in Marketing Cloud so that you don't have to go find that URL. You can just say, oh, let me go browse for that. Um, so those are two things that are coming in the next release. And then as I mentioned before, it's sort of a lot of what we've been working on uh, is, is eventually leading to this integration with AppExchange. We've got to get through some internal processes first uh, with approvals. So it's likely not coming until early 2023, but we are working towards that, um, toward that eventual link. All right, so that, that does it for Package Manager. Um, I'd like to encourage people to stay engaged uh, with the Trailblazer community. We've got a page out there, Marketing Cloud Package Manager and under groups. Uh, not a ton of activity in the past, but we're hoping to drum up uh, some, some input in terms of the roadmap there. Um, for Automation Studio, you can sign up for beta features. So there are a couple links listed here. And then we're also gonna have uh, the organizers here, Matt, um, to send out uh, a quick survey of what you'd like to see. I'm gonna ask, actually ask you to stack rank uh, features for uh, the roadmap. So developer focused features, and you'll find that in that survey if, if you can get that sent out after, uh, after the meeting. But that is it for me.
Great. Thank well, thank, thank you so much, Carl and Rob. Um, good. Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for uh, taking the time to um, share these really exciting features with us today. I've got a, a few questions, and I'm sure that we're going to have some questions coming in. Um, if you have questions for uh, Carl or Rob, please um, add them to the chat window, and uh, we'll moderate them and, and field them. Um, so firstly, one for Carl, and then uh, two for Rob. So Carl, you know, with that uh, uh, trigger automation API, you showed um, uh, this additional uh, key value pair you can include in your payload with a deduplicate key. Uh, can you explain how that works and why why you would use it as an optional uh, parameter? Yeah, yeah. So that so if we take maybe AWS um, as our example, you know, if you you know one of the paths that we um, have some a tutorial around in documentation is using a Lambda function to trigger an API call into Marketing Cloud. So inside of uh, S3, you can you know create an event notification to a Lambda, and as part of that payload on a file upload to an S3 bucket, there's some unique keys for that event. And in that Lambda function, you can grab that unique key and pass that to Marketing Cloud, and we'll make sure that. You know, in, in the case of a Lambda function or an Azure function or just maybe an API retry, if you're sending us multiple calls with that same file name, without that deduplicate key, we would process, potentially we would queue, similar to file drop, all of those API requests and process the same automation multiple times looking for the same file name. So with that dedupe key, you can ensure that we're only processing that uh, request one time for that given file name. Right, okay. So if you send like an identical payload, it will just skip it then? Correct. Correct. It won't Correct. It won't yeah, work. Okay. Yep. Right, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then for uh, for Rob, really two questions. Um, something I've observed um, in, in previous releases was uh, when I'm creating a package, and let's say this is a package of emails, and that um, those emails contain image assets. The, um, the image assets in the uh, in the package for when I, I deployed it, um, still use the, use the absolute URL to the images hosted in another Marketing Cloud account. Um, does that, uh, it, it, do you um, go and, um, is that supported or do you go and uh, redeploy the image assets and build those uh, uh, absolute URLs? So, I, I mean, it should be building if it's new. Uh, I know that there had been some a uh, couple people submitted a bug that that had happened. Um, those references had gotten stuck, but I don't believe that that is. I mean, I don't, I don't think that happens in every single case. I think that that may be in certain cases the way things are. Some things are configured. I would check on that to make sure uh, that that is still the case because I know that we did a ton of bug fixes in the most recent release as well. Um, and there were a lot of them related to the content and the data extension uh, issues that people were getting. So I, I would, I don't know that that is a widespread issue. I haven't heard that that is something that customers are continually encountering. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. I mean, it's there's something that I encountered. Um, uh, look, it, it was it was a while ago. I can't remember, so I probably need to retest. Um, regarding the um, uh, the um, kind of low use of the replacement string. I think this is a really powerful feature. And I think that once um, people start creating these solution packages, and you indicated that this came out in in the March release, this is a, a great use case for that, you know, to, um, and it, particularly with its additional enhancements now of the uh, image picker and color picker, I think that's really exciting. Other question I have is um, uh, something that I, I trip up on a lot is that when creating these, uh, uh, packages that contain email assets and those emails reference a, a cloud page, perhaps you're using the cloud page as URL and script function, um, you get an error. Are you, uh, that's because you don't go and package up cloud pages. Um, is that is that planned? It was on the roadmap for? Um, so we added cloud page support. Uh, we started with the basics of cloud pages back in October. Uh, we enhanced that in the February release, and then uh, we we did fix some bugs in the most recent release around that as well, because it was packaging 
it was it was packaging something wrong with collections, but at any rate, it, it we fixed a, a bunch of stuff in that in the most most recent release with Cloud Pages. So yes, it should be packaging those items, Fantastic. Uh, even when referenced via AMP script. So yeah, I would recommend a new test on that. Oh, that's awesome. So we'll go and just package a like landing page and code resources and deploy them. Awesome. Great. Oh, that's really exciting. I look forward to checking that out. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to go and add them to the chat window. And not um, many shy people. We have many people registered for the event, and uh, I think because of the time differences, it's kind of challenging for some. We have a lot of people watching the recording, so um, I'm sure that uh, we'll have a much wider audience. Um, just on so, the earlier, yeah, just sure. on the earlier, we generally get about 400 views per month on any of the recordings so whilst there's not hundreds of thousands of people here we certainly will get them to have a look i've got to say also kyle and rob thank you so much for what you've done today. a lot goes into preparing this and it's obvious from what you've done just to present to us today um, yeah, but, uh, one of the points that came up in the chat was how do we do some of these things and that sort of sparked um, some interest what we'll do is just following up from this is just a number of short um, package manager workshop events just to unravel some of what you've talked about. Certainly, Rob, you took that the, what you mentioned in terms of the do's and the don'ts. Um, I, I find on projects, we end up doing project specific do's and don'ts. So um, we'll definitely be unraveling those a bit more, creating a page and providing an opportunity for more community participation on that page. Um, about all the do's and don'ts that they've got with Package Manager, and that also might help with um, the features, the feature request you've got there. Certainly get the links that everyone's talked about um, in our email, which will follow up this event. Um, Carl, I will be signing up to the um, Trigger SFMC beta. I can't wait to find out more about that. It sounds, um, it sounds interesting. Um, I really need to unravel that and learn more. You did mention about encryption. Are there any changes there? I did notice encryption was on one of the slides. Are there any changes to how encryption works with imports on Automation Studio? No, it's, so it, it's similar to uh, in, uh, encryption and decryption today. So you can you know, import and export to uh, your public cloud destinations. So, you know, in those scenarios where a customer wants to do you know, client-side encryption, encrypt the file, uh, we'll, we support that as well, right? We'll download the file and then you're setting up your, your key, uh, you know, your private and public key uh, inside Market Cloud and we'll decrypt the file and import that into a data extension. So that's still supported. Uh, I think what I was kind of diving into is uh, most of the time in when, when I'm talking to customers about their security requirements, it's additional security um, or additional uh, precaution around the FTP protocol. And so because we're downloading files over HTTPS often, and, and the customer can now kind of allow list those IP addresses that we're downloading those files with from those destinations. Sometimes security organizations may say, hey, we don't need to encrypt the, with client side encryption any longer because of that. Uh, so that will ultimately speed up the process and, and may make it uh, you know less complicated on the customer side. Thanks, Nick. Uh yeah, um, then, sorry, Matt, before I, I saw a question did pop up around the event notification service. Uh, so I, I, uh, I shared that uh, we will be authorizing to uh, external sources using password and cloud credential grant type. Uh, Elliot asked a similar question a couple days back when we were um, discussing this and uh, stay tuned. You know, I had a sneak peek at the documentation, which will be, which should be live this week. So, um, you know, appreciate your patience on that one. And there'll be a lot more detail coming on how to make that possible. So, um, but yeah, I, I also just wanted to, well, I have the, have the, the mic, if you will, Elliot and, and Matt, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. This has been great. Great. Sure. On the, on the, another question on the dedupl deduplicate key, uh, if you're using S3, for instance, those, you know, the, the key, like the e-tag key uh, or similar, those are always unique. Um, you could do you know, MD5 or something like that to ensure, but it uh, just depends what value you're using kind of as that, you know, to, to pass. Makes sense. Good. 
and maybe we'll wrap up there. Um, sure. Well, hang on, there's a question from Jason just come in. So when I'm importing this part from... We've still got yeah. comments ahead. So please stop okay. the questions in the chat. Yep, I, I think it's um, fine. Thank you. Sure. So, um, okay, can I just read out this question from Jason? So when importing files from S3 or Azure via import activity, could the source files be deleted from S3 or Azure by import activity after the files are imported into SFMC? I mean, I know in the, uh, and don't want to steal your thunder, but the, the tracking extract activity, sorry, the data extract activity, there is a, um, a, a extract type of delete file from SFTP. Um, that uh, support isn't um, included by default, but support can enable it. Um, so just one second, I've got two um, hungry dogs um, chasing me. Um, so, but yeah, if you want to kind of elaborate on that, is, there, um, is, that, is that what you'd recommend or a different method? Yeah, at the moment that's, that is not uh, supported in, ter in terms of deleting from kind of you, like customer managed locations you we have a little more control over our own um, and and right now that that is not you know supported but definitely can take that as a, a point of feedback and, and see what we can do about that I guess okay. from a, a workflow point of view server side JavaScript on the automation could call an endpoint on s3 to remove a file so uh, you could that could be backed up but, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah not yeah not today, um, but uh, yes, because uh, uh, by by default, yeah, they, I mean they're deleted after what was it, fourteen or twenty-one days? I can never remember. But um, yeah, the solution today would be just to have that uh, um, data extract activity, and um, yeah, you can get support to enable that. Um, well, I think a data extract type. Yeah, I think J Jason's referring to at the source destination. So. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right, if we're ignoring we FTP or you know safe house or anything like that, we're saying in the S3 bucket. If I understand the question correctly, it's can we delete the file from S3 after importing? Oh, I see. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're so, right. yeah. so the extract yeah. activity would right. just be kind of like the marketing cloud uh, FTP server. Uh, I'm with you. Yep. Yeah, of course. Bucket. Thank you. Good. Okay. Well, I don't think there are any. Um, further questions, so I think we'll close it off there. Um, thanks, for the well, yeah, thanks again, uh, Carl and Rob, for joining. Uh, that's uh, really informative, really exciting. Can't wait to start testing out some of these new enhancements. And uh, um, we hope to see you at our, our next meetup. Matt, do you want to have, have a, uh, just a few words about the um, event in July that you're planning? Yeah, sure. So the group's planning a, um, a SFMC recipe um, hackathon. And so we've got on our Slack channel, um, we've got a channel there. We've got some people joining to talk about some of their community projects that they're working on. A bit of a thread that we've had going all year. And including this with um, Package Manager is how to deploy things, how to have automated workflows, how to how to get the community engaged and contributing to, um, to recipes. So um, we'll be sort of deep diving into that in July. In August, as mentioned, we've got the hybrid event. This will be our first one since 2019. So it's, it's been three years in the making, and we're so looking forward to that event. Um, we'll be online. We've got people joining um, globally um, to present, um, which is um, which is fun. So different, different sort of format, different sort of um, event, uh, but that's one we're looking forward to. We have been uh, running additional events, so more than just the monthly events. As mentioned, we'll get some more package manager and prompt workshops organised. Um, our LinkedIn group's just about to topple over um, 10,000 members, and we're getting a lot of um, a lot of comments on there about about what people are interested in learning more about. So between that, the Slack, um, the the group itself, which we've got on Trail Laser. Um, there's certainly lots of questions and interest. When the email comes out, it'll have all the links. After this meeting, it'll have a, a, a link to the video. And as always, any of those emails, if you've got a question, reply to the email and we'll get an answer to you just as quickly as we can about anything to do with Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, enjoy. Bye.